Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest wishes to remain anonymous. With that in mind, I'm just going to call him Brad. Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Well, it's great having you. Brad, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I'm a nearly 50-year-old white male, born and raised in Southern California. I'm in the finance and business uh, field. I was a surfer when I was young, uh, big wave surfer as I got older a little bit. I uh, very much a risk taker, bungee jumper, skydiver, went through a divorce. I'm now uh, single, so to speak. My father was an avid gun collector, which he passed on to me. He passed away not too long ago, and I kind of followed in his footsteps. I'm a big gun guy, uh, just like my dad and like his dad was. I have a couple of children, both girls. I live in what would be called North Riverside County, California. Starting a new job here on Tuesday in the finance field. And uh, finishing up a second bachelor's degree in accounting and finance. Well, even though you're knocking on the door for 50 years of age, you're not exactly over the hill by any means, but it sounds to me like you've packed a lot of life into your almost 50 years. I'm impressed. Uh, Yeah, I've had an interesting life, let's say that. I've had a lot of experiences that I don't think a lot of people have had because of my, my business background, and it's easy to do a lot of things um, when you have made a fair amount of money. I'm certainly not wealthy, but there was a time that I was doing considerably well, and that afforded me the ability to do some things that perhaps other people don't do. Or don't get a chance to do, I should say. Well, it sure sounds like you did do things like that, and that's a good thing. Nothing to be ashamed of. You just mentioned that you consider yourself to be a risk taker. Do you think that made you having your encounter a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I started listening to Dogman Encounters in, I was trying to think of whether it was January or February of this year. I'm pretty sure it was in February, and I got uh, bit by the Vic Cundiff bug, so to speak. And once I started listening to the Dogman Encounters, I, <laughs> as I told you in the pre-interview, I started using your voice to go to sleep at night. I would just listen to Dogman Encounters on my laptop as I was going to sleep. And at first I thought this was strictly an entertainment site. I, I never really knew that before you anyway, that there was really such a thing as dog men. I, you know, I would have thought maybe werewolves, but you've schooled me on that with what that really is. And, you know, there's obviously a huge difference, but I, I really did just think it was an entertainment site. And then, you know, as I started listening to, as I've told you now, nearly all of your shows, maybe not all, but most of your shows, I realized that, you know, this is a real phenomenon, just like, Bigfoot or Sasquatch or whatever name you want to give it, but perhaps a bit more terrifying, but it's along those same lines. And yes, I've been a risk taker my whole life. I have jumped out of a plane twice back when you could still do it solo. I've bungee jumped probably 30 times in my life. I surfed waves that I probably, because I was never a professional or even close, but I, I surfed waves that were far too big that I probably shouldn't have been on just to be able to say that I did it. So I, you know, I don't want to sound, you know, like I'm trying to come off uh, like a tough guy, but, you know, I, I don't know if it's because of my dad, Um, you know, he was kind of the same way, but, you know, I don't get scared really easy. And I've always kind of had um, 
strong dislike for people that panic because nothing good happens when you panic in any situation. So I don't run from scary or difficult situations. I've done some things in the past just to prove that they could be done. And I've really been like that my whole life. I mean, in a number of fights I've gotten into and just, I don't know if it's a psychological thing or, or perhaps maybe I am uh, borderline insane. I don't know, but I just don't get scared that easy. And in this particular case, I think it was a good thing because I was able to really look at what I was seeing. And as I told you in our pre-interview, Vic, because this happened so quickly after when I started watching your shows, I thought for the first few weeks that I had just lost my mind, that I, I didn't really see what I thought I saw. But as I kept going over to my mind and the details that I had, I, there was no doubt in my mind that I was seeing it. I, I don't know. It's almost like I was um, trying to look for a way out so that I didn't have to face it, I guess. I Maybe I'm just crazy. And it's kind of coincidental that, you know, four months after I start listening to your show, you know, out here in Southern California, I have a dogman encounter. I mean, that's, what are the chances of that? You know, and I, that's what was going through my mind being a, a numbers guy. I, I thought to myself, what are the odds of that? But in a way, being as cool and as calculating as I can be, I think that I represent somebody that could give a real description and, you know, going over what I saw, you know, maybe better than other people could. That's not to say you haven't had some great people on because you have, but some people kind of get scared and panic. And I, as I told you when we first spoke, I, I never got the feeling that, I mean, truthfully, truly never got the feeling that I was in a grave amount of danger. But as I tell you the story, you know, you might think differently yourself, but that's just how I felt about it. Well, everyone's wired differently, so I guess it's not that strange to handle things that you went through the way you did, so. Yeah. Sometimes I just do things, Rick, to prove that they can be done, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily a good thing, because it's probably got me into some trouble I could have avoided otherwise, but it is what it is. That's right. It is what it is. Yeah, you just like to live life to the fullest, and yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Even though you knew about the show before you had your encounter, you waited almost two months to contact me after you had it. Why'd you wait so long? Well, I did. I waited six weeks or so. I think it was about six weeks after it happened. I mean, as I said, the first, I don't know, I would say two weeks, I really... I wasn't sure that I believed it, to be honest, Vic. I mean, I, here I, like I said, here I've been listening to your show, going to sleep, listening to Vic Cundiff's voice at night, right? Listening to all these stories. And, um, I started to think, you know, maybe, maybe I just had it in my mind and that was some sort of, of course, I don't do drugs. So that wasn't it. And I certainly wasn't drunk that night. Um, I'm kind of a health guy. So, you know, as I sat back after, and that's one of those things, I mean, I'll remember that for the rest of my life. It's one of those, uh, you know, encounters that you, you remember for the rest of your life. I doubt very seriously that I'll ever have that encounter again. I mean, I wanted to have another encounter, but you kind of squared me away on that. So, but, um, it's something that, you know, you, you're never going to forget. And I think it just took me a while to process it and go over it in my mind and, make sure that I really did, you know, see what I thought I saw. But, you know, after a few weeks, I realized that, you know, that really did happen. And I've went back, as I told you uh, in the pre-interview, I've been back to that very spot um, 15, 16 times. And twice I stood right where the dogman was so I could get an idea of his height. So... Because you're so analytical, I think you're definitely better suited to describe what you saw and describe what happened to you the night that you had your encounter than most eyewitnesses who have been on the show. So, like you said, I do agree. That's a good thing. I appreciate that. Thank you, Vic. Oh, you're welcome. Before you tell us about your encounter, please tell us about the place where you had it. Um, I live in Southern California, as I said, born and raised. 
everybody thinks that Southern California, you know, for people who don't live here, that everybody, you know, is a surfer and everybody lives on the beach. I know because I've spoken to East Coast people before and they just assume that and some of the flyover parts of America as well. But it's not like that. You know, Southern California is actually it's got that um, chaparral topography and, you know, you can be in the mountains in an hour from the beach. I mean, and you've got deserts that are an hour from that. I mean, you really do have everything that you would want in Southern California. That's not to say that I'm not growing tired of Southern California, as I told you, and I will be leaving at some point uh, in the next couple of years just because of the population. But, you know, everybody thinks that it's Southern California spe- specifically is, is a certain way, and it's not. I mean, it's got hills, it's got mountains. And where I live in North Riverside County, not all that far from Palm Springs to give people an idea. Most people know where Palm Springs is. I'm within an hour of Palm Springs. So to give you an idea, but, um, I live up against some hills that border some mountains and it's very rustic and it's what I call like old California. It is, you know, I live in basically a retirement community and you know, if you were to come here, it's not LA, it's not, you know, San Francisco, it's, it almost has like, you know, I know this is going to sound a little ridiculous, but it almost has like a um, Midwestern feel to it, where I live. And um, I'm literally a mile from mountains, and maybe half a mile from the foothills of those mountains. But to answer your question, it would be considered northeast, I guess, of Riverside County. From the way you describe it, it sounds like a beautiful place. You've got me ready to pack my bags. Oh, it's Southern California. If even people from like Florida and Hawaii and other places like that, when they've been and lived in Southern California, they will tell you that it's, you're just talking about weather because it's got its own set of problems, right? I mean, I'm not saying there's not problems here because there is major ones but not the least of which is that you know california is becoming a communist state but anyway um it is a wonderful place as far as the weather and the topography i mean it's there's nothing better i mean people from like i say from florida hawaii will tell you that you know there's no place like southern california if you're just looking for weather this is still the place to live yeah i've been there before and it's a beautiful place it is it is beautiful. That's what, and that's the reason why I'm still here, Vic. To be honest with you, I would have been gone long ago if it wasn't for the fact that I was born and raised here, and that also, it's just you can't beat the weather. You just can't. I mean, my my memories of Christmas are 75 degrees with my cousins out throwing a football in the front yard, and other people are like talking about building snowmen, and we're playing football in the front yard. So, you know, <laughs> it's a different type of life say that yeah i'd say it must be that's got to be nice all right brad please tell us about your encounter give us every last detail that comes to mind okay this happened on friday june 28th i believe was the date that it happened I'm, i know it was a friday night but i'm pretty sure it was june 28th and um because i go to school i have a fairly sedentary sedentary life and being a finance guy, you know, you're always looking at charts and following the markets and stuff like that, which is what I do. And so I don't really have time as of right now while I'm still going to school. And as I told you, I'm starting a new job. I don't really have time to go to the gym. So what I try to do is walk four miles a day um, or more sometimes, depending on how much time I do have. But I found a place very close to where I live, where it's like a trail that goes up into the hills. And even if you go far enough back, it will actually take you into the mountains. But it's on private property. Obviously, the owners know that people walk on it, but (laughs) it is private property. And it's a large, very large ranch type property. And I got burned out on walking on concrete or asphalt. So... About a year ago, I started kind of like hiking around, seeing if I could find a better place to do my walks, right? That weren't so, you know, cookie cutter, so to speak. 
And just out of luck, I happened to walk up behind this uh, community that I live in. And there, here was this gate that you had to walk through. And then there was a, um, like a trail and it was probably five feet wide. And I just, you know, there's no real houses right next to it. So I just decided that I knew it was private property, but I walked up the trail and sure enough, it was exactly what I thought it would be. It took me up into the foothills and if you go far enough, it'll, it'll get you up to the mountains. So I started, I like to walk at night, uh, mostly because in the summertime, it's just so hot where I live that, you know, it's difficult to walk in 110 degree weather, I mean, no matter how good a shape you're in. So I started walking, uh, this was last year, I started walking at night. And then I kind of got into this walking late at night because of there's just like this really, really almost eerie quiet up in the, on this trail where there's just, I mean, it's just hardly any noise at all. And I like that. Right. And I, you know, I had seen smaller animals up on the trail, you know, uh, coyote and lots of squirrels and a couple of snakes actually. But, you know, as I told you in our pre-interview, you know, I always carry two weapons with me. Um, the night in question, I had a 357 Magnum on my hip that I cover with a jacket, a windbreaker, just so people don't freak out. And then I carry a 38 snub nose in an ankle holster, uh, just in case. So, you know, I, I, I have no problem going by myself up into the woods. But what I won't do is not woods, but the hills, so to speak. I won't do that unarmed just because not only because of your show, but just my whole life. I've heard too many stories about people encountering things, you know, in the woods or the hills or wherever, and they weren't armed and then bad things happen. So as much of a risk taker as I am, I'm not stupid. I'm a lot of things, but stupid isn't one of them. So that night I had my, um, Smith and Wesson 357 on my hip, as I said, and my 38 snubby in my ankle holster. And it was about 10 30, I don't know, maybe 10 40, somewhere in there where I left my house. And it takes about 10 minutes walking to get to the trail from where I live. And uh, by the time I got there, I, if I had to guess, I would say it was about 10 45. It was on a Friday night, so there weren't a lot of cars buzzing back and forth. There's not that many cars anyway because of where I live in the retirement community that I'm close to. But anyway, so I decided I was going to go for the walk. So I got to the uh, trail. I walked by and I have to kind of set it up for you how it is. On the right hand side, after you get up onto the trail, it's about five feet wide. The trail is on the left hand side or like it's like a sloping hill. So you really can't go anywhere on the left. It's almost entirely a slope hill as you're walking, which is kind of like the border of the property, I guess. And then on the right, it's not what I would call woods, but it's shrubs and trees, even some big rocks and boulders. Um, but there's a lot of little gaps in that on the right. And, um, I try to stay on the left as I walk just because I'm always thinking of security. So if something does jump out, you know, I have a chance to either run or if I can't run, at least pull my weapon. This particular night, I uh, was walking up the trail and I would say maybe a half a mile to three quarters of a mile onto the trail, uh, which is where it starts getting really dark. And I wasn't this particular night, it was I could see things because of the moon, but I also carry one of those little really powerful um, flashlights, the really really bright ones. Um, and it's a I like it because it's small. I can carry it in a little case on my on my hip. Um, but anyway, I always have it out. And as I was walking down, I got maybe like I say half a mile to three quarters of a mile down the trail. And to my right, I heard some rustling, which I hear all the time, you know, whether it's a raccoon or whatever. But this time I heard a little bit of a, I, would, I don't even know if I'd call it a growl, more of a grumble. Um, 
unlike some of your other guests, it wasn't like earth shattering or earth moving or anything like that. But I could tell that, that by the grumble, it, you know, this was a larger creature. So I thought, I don't think there's wolves in California, but that's what at first I thought it was looking back on it. Right. Um, but I heard it kind of grumble and, so I kept walking and then I got to like a, where there's a little opening, there's like a big tree, maybe 15 or 20 feet, nah, maybe 30 feet from the trail. And there's some opening so you could get a direct view of this tree. And as I got to like this bend where it kind of goes to the right, I stopped because I heard, you know, for a split second, and it turned out that it wasn't, but it sounded for a split second like it was something that was coming at me. So I flashed my light and I would say 50 to 60 feet uh, from me, if I had to judge it right, it could have been a little less, but if I had to guess, I would say 50 to 60 feet. I looked over and I flashed the light right next to me at first and there was nothing. But when I flashed over to this particular tree, I noticed a very large creature standing there and I immediately, of course, you know, because it was on its hind legs, I immediately <laughs> pulled out my 357 and pointed it um, while I was flashing at the flashing the light at this creature, and um, it was brownish colored with gray. It's the best way I could describe it. Um, it was a very mature looking uh, dogman, you know. Um, I guess if you want to call it a dog, man, right? I mean, that, that's what we're here for. Um, very well muscled, um, but not not like, uh, you know, a huge bodybuilder. Like I've heard some of the other kind of sinewy, almost like a very, very tall swimmer type muscle, um, but very thick muscular legs. And as I told you, I didn't notice any backwards um they didn't go backwards. I don't know exactly what some of the other listeners that I've heard um, have talked about that. I didn't notice that. they look, He looked like he was just standing, well, he was standing on two very, very powerful looking legs and feet that were probably, I wear an 11, he was, these were probably at least 50% larger than my feet and much wider. Um, he was a very, very well-endowed male um, with the, you know, extremely pointy ears. And when I say pointy, I mean like almost like needles at the tip. Um, if I had to guess, I would say he was somewhere between five and 600 pounds. And later when I came back to get an idea, cause I made a mental note when I was looking at him where he was standing by the tree where he came up to. And being that I'm six, three, I know now that he he had to have been eight feet or at least close to eight feet. And like I said, maybe five, 600 pounds. But as far as the encounter goes, he had, he didn't have amber or red eyes. He had yellow eyes and he, he gave me the distinct impression that he was the boss. I don't know how else to say it, but that's how I would describe it. He, I never felt evil, you know, uh, I know some of your other folks would say that, you know, it was a distinctly evil feeling, but I didn't get that from him. I mean, I did know that he was the boss and that if he would have wanted to, you know, he could have tore me to shreds, but I didn't get that feeling. And as I was pointing the gun at him, I just kept staring at him and I got the distinct impression Vic and I mean distinct that he was communicating with me because he didn't take his eyes off mine and I didn't take my eyes off him um he kind of when I first looked at him he wasn't touching the tree he was just standing next to it but at some point he put his hand against the tree or his paw or whatever you want to call it I noticed that his fingernails I would say they must have been his hands were probably three times the size of mine, but not as big as that picture that you have on your, um, 
your website. They weren't quite that big and neither were his feet quite that big, but he had very large hands. And I noticed he had about maybe I would say two inch black or they appeared to be black uh, fingernails coming out. And this was a hand. This wasn't like a, I mean, it was a claw in the sense that they were big nails, but it looked like really bony or arthritic. If you had to like equate it to a human's hands, I would say they looked like an arthritic person's hands, kind of knotty and bony. Um, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't make any threatening moves towards me, but I think he knew, I am pretty sure I told you this in our original interview. I think he knew that I was fully capable of shooting him and, while some of the folks believe that these animals, and I do believe that they're animals, by the way, um, whether, you know, whatever animal we're, talk we're talking about, I don't know if this is some sort of a hybrid or just a cryptid that's never been known or, or what, or maybe it is a demon of some sort, but it's occupying the physical realm. So since we can see it, I have to conclude that it's physical, but, you know, I never got the feeling that he was going to attack me or, but I, I do, I did, you know, as he was communicating with me, I know he must have, if he was, he must have read my thoughts and known that I was fully capable and had every intention of emptying my gun in him if he made it move at me. But I would say that this whole encounter lasted for maybe two minutes, no more than three. And at some point when we were staring at each other, I finally, I, I wouldn't say he smiled at me, but I don't know what other word to use to describe it. He almost looked like he was grinning at me. Um, but when he, after he communicated with me, I just lowered my gun. I, I mean, I didn't take my finger off the trigger, of course. I'm not stupid, but. I lowered my gun and it was funny. As soon as I lowered my gun, he dropped down to all fours and he stared at me for another 10 seconds. And I was staring at him. I, I didn't keep my light. I mean, my light was on him the entire time, but you know, once he went down on all fours and I didn't hear any, um, I didn't hear any of that popping stuff that I've heard others describe. I, I know I'm comparing this to a lot of, but I've listened to so many of your shows, Vic, that I'm, I can't help but compare to some of the other experiences people have had. But um, when he fell onto all fours, I just kept the light on him. And he, well, I forgot to say in the beginning, when I didn't know what it was, I took three or four steps toward him before I realized what I was looking at. And I don't know if he got threatened by that, but as soon as I saw what it was, I didn't take any more steps forward. And that's when I drew my gun and I held it on him until I lowered it. But I have no doubt that if he wanted to, this, this was a large, intimidating, imposing creature. I mean, eight feet tall, five to 600 pounds is the best I could gather. Although you say that might even have been heavier because of that rule you were telling me about, but. Um, but I had to guess, I would say somewhere between five and 600. And he wasn't like, uh, like I said, a bodybuilder. I mean, he was definitely muscular, but it was more sinewy type long muscles. He was older. If I had to guess, I, I, I would say that he was a very mature male, but I also got the distinct impression that he was the leader. If there was a pack around this dog, man would have been the leader of the pack. There's no doubt in my mind. He just he didn't seem frightened or, or, uh, you know, intimidated by me whatsoever. And I'm not a small man and I'm armed, but he didn't seem too worried about me at all. When he fell down onto his, um, uh, all fours, like I said, he looked at me for about another 10 seconds and then he turned around and went directly away from me. And I, I took about two steps forward just so I could see where he was going. And I did see him leap after he took maybe 15 or 20 steps towards wherever he was going. He left to the right. And 
I mean, I didn't see where he went. It was dark, and, you know, this is probably 11 o'clock at night by this time. And I didn't see where he want, went, but I knew that he jumped, and he jumped a long way. So it was uh, quite an encounter, and I've been back, as I was telling you in our pre-interview, I've been back probably 15 or 16 times to that very place at the same time, maybe hoping that I would see him again, but I haven't. And I did on two occasions. One, the very next night, I stood exactly where I went into the brush and stood exactly where he was standing. And being that I'm 6'3", I was able to see, okay, well then this, this character was very, if not eight feet, very, very close, like 7'10", 7'11". But I would say, I would say he was eight feet. And if I had to guess his weight, I would say five to 600 pounds. So a very large creature, but it was kind of cool to stand right where, <laughs> right where he had been standing. Um, you know, I mean, I had, my head was on a swivel, right? Because I wanted to make sure he didn't come up behind me, but I'll never forget it. You know, um, <laughs> I still sometimes pinch myself, you know, I had told you that I wanted to um, go to Oklahoma because of some family and uh, perhaps hunt a dog man. And you schooled me on that. So that's off my bucket list. But that was something I was thinking about doing just because it's just such a fascinating uh, topic, you know. Oh, it is a fascinating topic. No denying that. Looking back on how your encounter played out and considering the fact that you're a thrill seeker, would you say it was a positive experience for you? I don't know if I could say, I mean, I don't know if I could say it was positive because there's always a chance I could have completely misjudged him and the situation. And I could have been a casualty because, you know, people have died dealing with these creatures. I mean, lots of people have been taken and at least according to the people that I've heard on your show. So I don't want to say it was positive, but I can also say that it wasn't like this terrifying, oh my God, I had nightmares about it for, you know, I slept fine that night. I mean, I actually, I take that back. I didn't sleep fine, but that was only because I was so excited that I, <laughs> that I saw a dog man, right? A creature that large and with really no, no problems. Um, he just gave me the impression that he was out, you know, doing his thing and, we crossed paths and he didn't growl at me. He didn't, I mean, he did grumble when I was walking by, but I'm not even sure that that was with any intention of harm. I mean, that may have just been his normal, I mean, this is a 500 pound creature. That may have just been his normal sound. Um, but I don't, I didn't, I never felt, I can't say that I wasn't scared when I first saw him, which is why I drew the gun as quickly as I did. Right. Just in case. But, the longer that I stood there, I realized that he wasn't going to attack me because if he was going to attack me, he would have attacked me before I could have gotten ready for him in the beginning. He could have just jumped out at me from the brush. I mean, the, the entire path is only five feet wide. So if he was going to attack me and he had intentions of hurting or killing me, he would have just jumped out before I could see him. I think he wanted me to see him. I think he was curious. This is just my feeling and my opinion, right? Um, I'm sure some people would say, no, it was this or it was that, but I just got the feeling he was wanting to check me out. He wanted me to see that he was there. And, you know, in fact, I think he was telling me, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but in his own way, I, I feel like he was communicating with me, telling me that the gun was unnecessary. And that's why I lowered it. So, but to answer your question, I mean, yes, me being a thrill seeker to the, degree that I am, maybe I dealt with this differently than somebody else would have. Um, but I can tell you that the adrenaline rush that I got from that made it all worthwhile, even if there were some, some negative effects. The, the, that's why I went out there so many times since looking, you know, and I walk on the very same path. I told you just the other night, I was out there on the very same path. I always stop now at that spot and I flash my light over to see if I've, if I've got a buddy now, right? That that will come out there and <laughs> and uh, visit with me. So to answer your question, I you know me being a, a thrill seeker, I think you know maybe maybe I process the information a little different and react a little different. Um, 
the biggest thrill though that I had, Vic, was the next night standing in the very spot, and I even put my hand up against the tree the way that he did. That was a thrill. That was a little bit edgy because where it is, it's all dark, and you're in the midst of trees. So if there, if there was one around you, he would have ample opportunity to get to you before you could do anything. Um, oh, and I wanted to say, I know that other guests have said that it always seems like there was another one around, you know, or there's more than one around. But I, I've never once got the impression that there was a second one around. Now, is it possible that there was and I just didn't see it or hear it? Yeah, maybe. But, you know, as a human, when you get into a situation like that, you know, your senses are heightened, right? And my head was on a swivel because all of the stories that I've heard on Dogman Encounters, you know, were come rushing back. We're like, oh, you know, there's one in the bush too. And if you shoot the one, you're going to have to deal with the other. And then, you know, so I was cognizant of the pack thing, but I never saw another one. I never heard another one. I, and I never felt like there was another one lurking. I, I just got the impression that he was out doing his thing and, that was it. How sure are you that your 357 would have stopped him if he had decided to attack you? <laughs> That's a fair question, Vic, but you have to understand, I wasn't planning on having a dogman encounter <laughs> when this happened. So, you know, it is a seven round, it's a model 686 plus, it carries seven rounds, and I actually have an eight rounder too, but... You know, I'm not sure that it would have stopped him uh, based on the things that you told me. And, you know, you're an expert in this. And, and some of the other people who've supposedly put, you know, high-powered rounds into these things. And, it, you know, they, it hurts them, but it doesn't bring them down. I probably would have had to put all seven. And my feeling is if I was going to stop him, I would have had to put all seven in his head. And I'm not sure I could have done that with something that large charging at me. But I can tell you this. I would have put all seven rounds into his body. And at the very least, you know, he would have been injured by the time that he got to me. But to your point, I do now carry a, uh, <laughs> I think I told you this in our original, uh, I carry a 454 Kasul, which is a much, much, much larger round now on my side when I go out. I don't carry the 357 anymore um, for the very reason that you were talking about in, this is my opinion. I know we have a difference of opinion on this, but you know, I have a feeling if you were to empty a 454 Kasul into his head, that he would go down. Those are very, very large rounds. And, um, you know, I, I don't believe there, I could totally be wrong about this. And I know that you're the expert. You have a lot more knowledge than I do, Vic, but my feeling is that, if they're inhabiting this realm and they're physical, then they can be brought down. It's just that they move very quickly and it's difficult to get enough rounds in them to bring them down. Although I've heard some of your guests say that they have brought them down. But the reason I think that a lot of people haven't who have shot them is that it's not, these creatures are not going to go down even with a high powered rifle from one round. And I don't recall anybody actually putting I could be wrong on this one, but I'm thinking some of your shows, I don't think anybody's ever gotten a headshot with a high powered rifle. I could be wrong about that. You've done more shows than I probably listened to, but anyway, I started carrying a 454 school now just because I want to at least have a chance uh, if I were to encounter that and I worst was to be attacked. You know, I have a hard time believing that a 454 wouldn't stop it or at the very least make it think twice about attacking you. let's put it that way i mean some of the stories that i've heard you gotta you know you gotta wonder what we're really dealing with here but like i told you when we were talking that very first time i i don't know i just have this feeling that if somebody could get a 50 cal or so into the head no matter what this creature is if it's in, in the physical realm then it's going to, I mean, how do you survive a 50 cal to the head? So I, you know, I, I could be wrong. I've told you that, Vic, I could be very wrong, but I just think people don't go about it the right way. If you're going to bring one of these creatures down, you have to put multiple rounds in them. And 
it's not just one shot and the, you know, it's going to, the creature's going to fall over like it would be with a wolf or a coyote. I mean, you're talking about five, six, seven, eight hundred pound creature. I mean, as an example, you know, it takes usually way more than one round to bring, you know, a 1200 pound grizzly down. Even if you've got a 44 mag or something like that, you need a much, you know, if, even if you could bring it down with that caliber, you're going to have to put five or six rounds in it. So it definitely, <laughs> it definitely makes you think, or at least I did afterwards that I was like, man, this 357 isn't going to, isn't going to do the job. So that's why I started carrying the, the much larger gun. Some of the listeners might be wondering how you could have noticed all the details you saw that night in the dark. What would you say to them about that? First off, I would say that, and I'm the first to acknowledge that, especially where I live, I mean, this story is, I'm very critical of your listeners, as I told you. And the thing that would be most, you know, unbelievable to me about my story is where it took place. Of course, if you lived here and you saw where I lived, maybe it wouldn't be that unbelievable. But you know, people are going to hear Southern California and they're going to be like, surf's up, dude. You know, that type of thing. It's not where I live isn't like that. But to answer your question, the moon was directly behind this creature coming through the trees. And this flashlight I have is extremely, uh, what do they call that? Lumens, I think, is how they judge it, right? The number of lumens. It's a really, really powerful flashlight and i was only like i said maybe 50 to 60 feet away and i took a step or two towards it so maybe it was even a little less than that but i i could see i mean i couldn't see like the wrinkles in his skin and i couldn't see you know the washboard stomach or any of the stuff i've heard other people like that mention i couldn't see that but i could see the general outline of him and i could see his ears and i could definitely see his eyes and his nails and I, and I could clearly see that he was a brownish color, which I don't know if that's maybe that's common to Southern Cal or or more in the West, because I've heard other people talk about gray and black. But he was definitely like a, a rusty brown type color, dark rusty brown with gray. And he was definitely an older. I could see it in his face. It was almost like he had gray hair, um, like you see sometimes with a, a dog where you can see it in their face. They have the gray around their eyes. Which I want to say, I would say that he looked like a German Shepherd only because that's what everybody says, right? I mean, I suppose you could say he kind of had that look, but to me, he more, I mean, again, that's as good as any description, but I would say he looked more like a wolf, like a, an Alaskan Malamute or, a, you know, something along those lines, his head, but it was much bigger than a, a you know a regular dog's head i would say twice the size of a regular dog but i got a really good look at him to i mean considering the circumstances uh and the time at night that it was and i think that was mostly due to the fact that the moon was directly behind him well considering how you had that bright flashlight it would definitely make sense that you'd be able to see all those details your parents live in an area where a lot of dogman sightings have been reported please expand on that for us well when I first went on your site, I was like, okay, there's no way that there's, you know, going to be sightings of dogmen in Southern California. But it turned out there was one in a city only like 15, 20 miles from me. And of course, this city is up against the hills and the mountains. The same mountains are right behind this city. It's kind of this city that I'm referring to is only like maybe 15 to 20 miles from me. And it's a long the same mountain uh, range. So it would make sense when I saw that, I was like, oh, okay. And this, this creature could easily go up into the mountains and you'd never see it again. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, caves up in there and little nooks and crannies where I don't think in my opinion, I'm going to say this, this is my opinion. I don't think you could have large packs of these things where I live because I don't hear enough. I mean, you'd hear more about it. I don't think there's like 15 and 20, you know, dogmen <laughs> packs running around where I live. It's probably the smaller three or four, maybe five type thing. If from where I live, I just don't think there's any way that uh, a large pack like that could hide itself. But if, 
it was surprising to me to see the creature where I live because every other, or basically every other story that I've heard on your show is from the East Coast or the Midwest and Oklahoma, Louisiana. You know, California is not where, you know, traditionally you would think of there being dogmen, but it just goes to show you that where I live in Southern California isn't like, you know, a desert or down by the beach. It's the hills. And as long as it was a small pack, they could survive up there. And really nobody where I live, nobody really goes up in these mountains. It's not like there's, you know, it's not like, um, big bear or anything like that. And people in California will know where I'm talking about, but right wood and all in up, you know, where there's lots of people, it's not like that where I live, they're pretty deserted. So it's possible that well, clearly that there could be some living up there. Well, they do live in places that you wouldn't expect them to be. So I guess it's not that big of a surprise. It's also, uh, real quick, I, I did want to say, I, I brought this up a second ago, but as I thought about this incident, what I thought a lot about was the coloring of this animal and how I hadn't really heard, and again, I haven't listened to every single one of your shows, but just about all of them, and most of the people talk about gray or black. Um, this creature was, was definitely a brownish color with gray you know, mixed in, but I don't think the gray was his natural color. I think the gray was from age. There's no doubt in my mind this was an older, I wouldn't say like elderly yet, but he was definitely a very mature dog man. Well, I told you before, I'll say it again. That sure had to be something to see. <laughs> well, uh, keeping this G rated, I would, it was really surprising to see how well endowed he was. That was, uh, <laughs> I was unprepared for that, but you know, I mean, he is a male and I bet you he's an alpha male too. So it was, uh, the whole thing was, <laughs> the whole thing was a sight to see, but I didn't uh, real truthfully though, Vic, I would tell you if, it, if, 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 if it scared me or, or I felt evil, I, I really just didn't feel any evil from this creature. I did feel threatened because I knew what, based on what I've heard on your show, what these creatures are capable of, right? And this guy was not a small little six-foot dog, man, right? That I've heard some of your people talk about. This was a large apex predator. And I was completely unprepared. It never even crossed my mind, Vic, when I started walking up there. I did think I might see some, you know, coyotes or uh, there's even people who say that there are still mountain lions up here, too. Um, but a mountain lion, you know, one round of the head, it's all over. So I, you know, that doesn't scare me too much, but I was never, <laughs> I was not prepared, uh, nor did I think it would ever happen where I would see a dog. And especially when you consider that I had just started listening to your show. So unique experience. Oh, I'm sure it was. <laughs> yeah. Life with dog men in it. It's a lot more intense and interesting. You alluded to this next topic a bit ago. Before we spoke for the first time, you thought it would be a good idea to try to kill a dogman and turn it in to prove their existence. <laughs> huh. Yes, sir. I did. You told us that you don't want to try it now, but please tell us what your plan to prove their existence originally was. Oh, man. You're going to embarrass me, Vic. Uh, well, I, since you're asking me, I'm going to tell, I'm going to say what you, you know, what happened? I had the idea that because I have family that live in Oklahoma, that I and there's a pair. Of, there's some mountains. I forgot what they're called, but they start with a W. That's all I can remember. But there's been like literally hundreds of dogmen sighting there, hundreds of Bigfoot sightings there. Um, there's even like a a TV crew that's shooting a um, some sort of a television show in search of Bigfoot in these particular mountains. And I have a friend. Not a, not a best friend, but somebody that used to work for me when I had a company a while back, who is a match shooter, um, meaning that he he's extremely good with a bolt-action rifle. And when I say extremely good, I'm talking 1,000 yards, 800 yards, putting something in a 2-inch or 3-inch circle. I mean, this guy is, you know, 
he's a professional. That's all I think I can say is that, and you know, what I had thought was I would take him with me. He could be the long range guy and I'd be the grunt that would run up and finish the dog man off. If he got a shot in at distance to the head and the thing was still moving or that I would be the one that would run up with a semi-automatic rifle and or a shotgun maybe and finish the job, kind of be the gopher for him. I'm probably a little bit more of a daredevil than he is. He'd be okay with shooting it from a distance, but I don't think he'd be okay with, you know, running up on it like I would. Um, but I had an idea that I would take my daughter, who's a bit of a amateur photographer, and the three of us would go and go to this place where all these dogmen sightings were and maybe take a two-week vacation and see if we could bring one down. Um, I think I'm smart enough that if we saw one, and, and I'm a gun guy. I mean, I, you know, I, I like guns and my thing is handguns. That's my, what I'm really good with. I'm not so much of a rifle guy. But I have rifles, but I'm more of a, a handgun guy. But I just think that under the right circumstances, learning all the things that I've learned on your show and some of the other imposters, because there's really only one big pundit, right? But some of the other imposters I've, I've heard some of the things that people have done and the mistakes that they've made in trying to bring them down. So I, I didn't know you were going to embarrass me with what my plan was, because now it sounds foolish after what you told me. But my plan was to bring one down and contact an organization such as the National Enquirer or something like that before the black helicopters show up and either take the body, because I do believe that these things have been killed before, and I do believe that the government, and I know that, you know, you support that idea too, that the government keeps from us that these creatures exist. Um, I hadn't thought all the way through about the economy collapsing because of it, but I guess that makes sense, at least to a degree. I don't know if I agree with you 100% on that, but it would make a difference in our economy if, if people knew that these eight and nine feet creatures that weighed 600 pounds, right, were lurking in the woods that could tear us limb from limb. So my idea was to take my daughter with me, and obviously I feel confident or I wouldn't take my daughter with me, right, um, and bring one of these down and then have my daughter take as many pictures, you know, as she could of the creature up close, and then contact before we contacted anybody else or told anybody else or made any cell phone calls, have somebody from National Enquirer or some other organization like that. And the reason I chose them is because I don't think some of the other more mainstream um, magazines or rags would show up, right? But I think National Enquirer would show up just because, you know, they would sell how many magazines from, you know, <laughs> I got a picture of a dog man and a guy standing there with his rifle next to it and it's dead on the ground. Um, and then we could take the body and, you know, take it to some sort of a facility and say, okay, here we go. Knowing that I've already taken the pictures, number one, and I've also given the story to the inquirer. It'd be like a three pronged attack, right? We've got the pictures, you know, we've got the journalist who showed up, took pictures and, you know, and then we've take it to some facility where they could, but I met a guy named Vic Cundiff and he schooled me on how other people much more experienced than myself have thought of doing <laughs> the same thing and that, you know, killing the dog man wouldn't be the end of it. That would be, I think your words were, that would be the beginning of my problems because if I, even if I were, I mean, according to you, even if I were to get fortunate enough to bring one down, you know, the government is going to do everything that it can to belittle me, besmirch my character and everything else um, so that it would appear that I made this up or it was a hoax or whatever. And next thing I know, I'm being audited by the IRS, all the stuff like that. But yes, I did <laughs> because I'm such a a risk taker, I thought, you know what, I can kill a dog, man. I, I'm just ballsy enough and crazy enough that I could do it. I think I, I think I could go out there with the right weapons and having this guy, you know, putting a shot into its head from a distance. And even if it didn't go down, you know, 
run and run up on it and, and finish it off at close range. I still think I could do it. It's just a question of <laughs> you've made it pretty clear that my life would change dramatically, not for the better, because if if it were to come out that there were dogmen, especially this size, I don't necessarily agree that it would, you know, come on. I don't, I don't think it would completely wipe out our economy, but would it have an effect? You made me think about that, and I know that you're a smart guy, so I, I respect your opinion. It, it probably would have an effect on our economy, and it would change the way lumberjacks do business. It would change people. And I told you this, Vic, I think it would definitely cut down on tourism, you know, to our national parks and stuff like that. And of course, the government doesn't want that. But I also believe that, and I'm not saying this is true, I'm, I'm simply offering an opinion. If you told me you wanted me to give my opinion, I believe that it's possible that these animals could be chipped because I've heard stories. I don't even know if it was on your wonderful program or if it was on other ones who shall go nameless, but where black helicopters show up and throw these things into a, a helicopter and fly off with them. Well, how could that be when, you know, unless they're chipped or something along those lines or they're being tracked or whatever, how could that be, you know, how would the government know? So, you know, I never thought of that. And after talking with you, I realized that, you know, it's very possible that if we brought one down, that they would, the government would be notified. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that that's the case, but from the stories that I've heard, it would make sense as to why, you know, the black helicopters uh, show up so quickly after. Um, and I've heard other people on your show talk about how, you know, if there was a dog man in the area, they've looked up and there's these black helicopters flying around that normally aren't there. So what are they there for? Well, it may be because one of these apex predators is doing things it shouldn't do and they're there to take care of it. Um, since you brought up our conversation, I would say, though, and I know you'll disagree with me on this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I do think, though, that dog men should fear us more than we fear them. Um, there is no apex predator like man. And, you know, you can say, well, you know, on a one on one scenario, well, of course, but that's really not logical because man have the faculties of their brain and they're going to use, you know, the most potent weapons that they can, whether that be hand grenades or whatever to stop a creature like this. And I think I told you this in our first conversation that if, you know, you were to put a squad of spec ops, you know, green beret or seals in there, you know, with fully automatic weapons, you know, come on, there's no way that a dog man is going to kill, you know, special operations guys. And, you know, I think, 10 or 12 of those guys could kill a whole pack of these things. No problem. Um, that's my opinion. And I know that you have a different opinion about that, but I just don't think that in the end, if we were to decide that we were going to take this, these creatures out, I mean, come on, are you telling me that we wouldn't be able to wipe them from the face of the earth? If that's what we really wanted to do. Of course we could just like we could wipe any creature out, Bigfoot, whatever. And so that's what I mean by, they should fear us more than we fear them. You know, as far as just pure terror goes, of course, you know, when you see an eight foot or nine foot creature that looks like this, it's going to put the fear of God into you. But I just, I don't know. I, I just think that we are the real apex predator. And I have a feeling that the dogmen know this because <laughs> they seem like they're very intelligent creatures. Um, but you're the one who talked me out of my little stunt that I wanted to do. Getting back to your original question, uh, after talking with you, I realized that probably wouldn't be in my best interest to attempt to bring one down, even though I do believe that it's possible. Understand that I didn't want to shoot down your idea to be a party pooper. I just do what I can to help dogman eyewitnesses. Whether it's helping them get over the trauma of their encounters or helping them avoid what I think would be a mistake that would put them at odds with the government. That's what was behind that. I put the idea to rest. My daughter is glad that I put it to rest, even though she would have came with me for sure. I know just out of the excitement of it, she would have came with me. But when I told her after our conversation, she's like, well, daddy, you know, he probably has a good idea, you know, and if they're what you think they are, then I'm sh it's pretty sure the government doesn't want that to get out. And I really hadn't 
thought that through, you know, I was more thinking of the adrenaline rush of actually having that moment, you know, where you run up on one and it's wounded and you got a chance to do what nobody else has done. Right. And actually finish one off. Although, you know, you've had people on who've said that they killed them, but there's never any proof of that. And, you know, to have the proof, even with all the trouble that it would bring Vic, you know, it is kind of cool to be able to say you were the guy that actually not only killed one, but was smart enough to get it to where it was known by the population. That'd be kind of cool. Oh, you definitely earn bragging rights if you're able to kill one. There's no denying that. Well, Brad, we're about out of time, but before we get out of here, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? I would just say that dogmen are, if they are what, what I think they are, I don't necessarily think that they're evil. You know, but it's like anything else. It's like with humans, right, Vic? I mean, you have bad humans and you have good humans. Um, you have bad Sasquatch and you have good Sasquatch. Some of them have terrorized people. Others have helped people. And I suspect that there's probably more bad dogmen than there are good, just based on the encounters I've heard on your show. But I'm just saying that I don't necessarily think that every single one of them is all about evil because let's face it, they being the apex predator that they are, if they wanted to kill more humans than they do or that we know about, they could and they don't. And I think that's because they're smart enough to realize that if they did, then, you know, if they killed enough people sooner or later, that spec ops team is going to show up and then they're going to have <laughs> a lot on their hands. So, you know, I just would say to people that, don't necessarily think that these are just evil creatures that are their only intent is to kill people. And, you know, I've heard enough people on your show talk about how, you know, they could have hurt them, but they didn't. And I think they just are territorial and they want to be left alone. And I really believe that they fear humans, not on a one-on-one -on -one basis, obviously, Vic, but you know what I mean? They, they know that if they start messing with humans to a large degree, then there's going to be more humans that show up. So that's all I would say is just in closing, I would say you have to take each dog man encounter, you know, as it is and for what it is, rather than just assuming that they're all evil, wicked creatures that are trying to kill everybody. Well, that's all very well said. Yeah. If they're half as bad as it's easy to make them out to be, then yeah, a lot of these encounters would turn out in a much different way. But right. having said that, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing that experience with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks again so much for your time. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.